Today's episode is sponsored by the Driven Foundation, located at staydriven.org. Never give up. Stay driven. Thank you for tuning in to Headquarters for Connecting Christians, HQ.com, a better way to buy books. I'm your host, Christiana Green. On today's episode, we have author Cindy Fiesel. Cindy, how are you doing today? Doing well, thank you. Awesome. Thank you. We're really excited to have you with us today. I just want to go ahead and share with our listeners a little bit of information about you. So for those of you who may not be familiar with Cindy, she was the wife and former NFL player, Grant Fiesel. Cindy's life was full of fun, football, and fame. However, things began to take a tragic turn when he walked away from the game. In Cindy's raw and emotional memoir, After the Cheering Stops, Cindy describes the debilitating effects of football-related injuries and concussions that not only shattered their life together, but ultimately took Grant's life. So, Cindy, that is just so much in a nutshell. And I know just even from reading the book, it definitely was a roller coaster ride for you, especially once he did um, leave the games. Wherever would you want to start about your story? Like, what inspired you to write it? What are you? What were you looking to gain by sharing your story? If you could just kind of give us a little info about that, that'd be great. Sure, I would love to. Um, I want to do a little brief backtracking here and say that um, when Grant and I met each other in college, we had an instant love affair. It was just a, an instant yeah. connection, and I know it was awesome. He, I say he was a Renaissance man. He loved music and poetry, and he was smart, and he was also athletic, which is such a great combination. I mean, you know, oh, he wow. was God. I know. So we met at a Christian college, a small Christian college out in West Texas, and it was Abilene Christian University. And he had gotten a full four-year scholarship. I'm sorry, that's hard to say. And so we, you know, we met on a blind date. I knew that he played football, but I didn't know about all of the things that he really loved, which were the things that I loved about him. I loved the fact that he played sports because I was interested in that, and that was great, but it was more interesting to me that he had a deeper faith and he had um, a, he he cared about so many things and and things that I cared about which was wonderful. So we had an instant connection. He was a soft spoken, beautiful man. He was tall and blonde, and I say he looked like the you know what we think of the California kid. You know he wore. <laughs> He wore hand t shirts and he wore a uh, five oh one button up Levi's, which I've never seen <laughs> flip flops, you know. So he was definitely a California kid. And I was from Texas and so anyway, we just a little brief history that it was just a, yes. you know, it was a great connection and he was just so he was so great. And um had a four point oh in college. He was not and an athlete. athlete. Now that's yes. a lot. That's a whole I lot. Love Jesus. An athlete and smart. Okay, Cindy, I'm, I'm seeing you. I'm seeing the connection here. I'm getting it. <laughs> yeah, I'm the, the whole package, okay? <laughs> and I, as I say, who wouldn't have wanted to hitch their wagon to that star? I mean he was Absolutely that I'd ever dreamed of. And so, you know, it just worked out great. So we got married and um, he he got accepted into all of the the dental colleges because he was going to be a dentist, and, and that's what his dream had been since he was age five, which is so funny. But got to, a chance to play in the NFL, got drafted, and and got by the Baltimore then the Baltimore Colts back in the eighties, and so um, it was just we kept thinking it was just the way God wanted our life to go. You know, he could go back to medical school or dental school later. He he did apply for medical school at one point and was accepted into every dental school and medical school in the state of Texas. He was an oh my academic. Gosh. Yes, he was an academic All-American all four years he played football, which was amazing, I thought. And no, it is. I, and I love that you're sharing that because I think a lot of times people assume that when people go into the NFL that their gift is just sports. And so, therefore, they weren't giving up something else to be there. So uh, this is also wow. you know, like, no, there was a, definitely another track that he could have taken. However, you know, of course you're going to go for it. You're like, you can't always go back to dental school or medical school later if it didn't work out. So I'm really right. glad you're giving this info. Well, thank you. I just think it's important for the whole picture to be painted. You know, I, I'm i an artist and I like to give everybody the full landscape, you know, just tell everybody all the good things about him because people think that because he died of cirrhosis of the liver and we got a divorce seven months before he he died that for some reason 
I shouldn't have the same lesser hand that I had in the beginning, but yet I do. Our story is a tragic love story. It's just, uh, you know, over the years after he retired from the NFL, and by the way, he played 10 years and 117 games, so that's a long oh goodness, That's a long career. <laughs> yes. So there, we thought what we thought was going to be a year or two and then go back to medical school and dental school ended up being most of our lives together. So um, it was really not what we thought, but yet the direction our life went in. And and I think that, you know, it is the ultimate guys club when you get into professional sports. Not many, let's say 1% of the men in the world get into the NFL. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. You know, you get a little uh, rush from that. Not a little rush. You get a big rush from that. I was like, oh, no, it's exciting. Yeah. 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 And, you know, we had great years. We met awesome people and had lots of uh, wonderful experiences. So I'm not taking any of that away. But I think that people forget in the real world that these men are human beings. They're not – we're not watching a video game. Somehow we disassociate exactly. the human being and what we see on television as being someone that has a life. And Grant had a life. He had he had uh, options, and he chose to play 117 games in the National Football League, which ultimately – led to um, him becoming an addict because he started taking pills in order to sleep and relieve himself from the pain. And listen, everybody has pain if you play in the mm-hmm. NFL. Mm-hmm. Oh, my gosh, yeah. If you're and playing so, in college, because I have friends yeah. who played college ball, and they were already, you know, taking lots of different painkillers and, you know, getting yeah. shots so they can get back out there on the field. And so it's, wow. it's intense. Definitely intense, and they're young. I mean, they start young. So you bet. And Grant retired at age 32. That's still young. <laughs> I mean, he retired in the NFL at 32 years old, and I say that he retired an addict. And wow. um, you know, he had been given pills for so many years for all the aches and pains. And at that time, we, I don't think we knew the repercussions of what just taking a pill would do to you. You know, it was Vicodin, Percocet. Like you said, the shots, all of those things that just kept him going were going to ultimately end up and destroy his life in the end, which we didn't have any idea at that age. We was left, information we, ever shared with you was like the risk factor of what that looked like of putting your body through that much physical strain so soon yeah. and so early? Like, did they ever share any of that? Maybe, I guess, the risk side of things? Never. Never. Um, I just say we were never privy to any information about what this was causing. Although Grant was going to be a medical doctor and had taken biology classes all his years of school and college, he still mm-hmm. didn't get the, the concept that your brain is soft. I never knew that either. I never learned that in school. I never learned that your brain was like an egg yolk or jello. I had never even heard mm-hmm. that concept for the last couple mm-hmm. of years. Wow. What he was doing all of those years is he was really destroying his brain, and we we had no idea the connection, no idea. So I just say in this day and time, with all of the scientific evidence that you can get just by Googling brain mm-hmm. in sports, yeah. it's amazing the information you can get. I'm a teacher. I was a mother of three children, and I can tell you this, that if Grant was still alive, he would be saying, I wish our boys had never played. I wish I'd never played. I know a lot of athletes say, oh, I would would do it again in a heartbeat. But I can tell you that Grant would not because he had options. He could have done something else. Oh, my goodness. And so towards the end, was there ever any information um, once you guys – because I saw in the book, I was reading through the book and how he ended up starting, like, different jobs. And so how did that go when it was like, okay, the lights are off, right? And right. we're no longer out on the field, but we've got mm-hmm. this, like, thing going on in the background that we don't want people to know about. Because I, I read how private he kind of was, especially with your guys' family, of not wanting to kind of show that side of like, what was going on. So how do you feel like he handled transitioning out of the limelight and all of the games and the fanfare? Like, how did that How did that feel for you all? Well, I think that's I think it's hard. That's an excellent question, and I don't get asked that a lot, and I really um, was trying to show when I wrote my book, After the Cheering Stops, that really when it stops, it stops, you know. I mean, Yeah, was, and that's what I was picking up on. Yes. I mean, he really, um, he already 
had damage, you know. So he came out of the NFL with an addiction problem, so he was constantly looking for something to fill uh, those pills. You don't come out of the NFL with a prescription over a lifetime for Percocet and Vicodin. And so Mm. I think that he was trying to help himself the only way he knew how, and that was Mm self-medicating through alcohol. Um, Mm -hmm. He he became a closet drinker. He started hiding alcohol. And um, I say that every night after he he quit playing football, he medicated himself. And it started in the evenings at night just a little bit, you know, in his cup with Diet Coke or whatever. So those things just started to constantly happen. Um, The hiding part of the alcohol, I think, like you said, was just because it's hard to face those things. I mean, who really wants to talk about that? And especially we as Christians, we we put all of these – um, walls up and act like we're perfect to everybody and I was part yes. of that I was mm-hmm. part of that I was a codependent along with him and tried to make my our family believe that everything was okay and I just say um, please if you're going through anything that's similar to this in your marriage or your life you can't do it alone you have to have help yeah. you have to reach yeah. someone you have to reach out to someone. A Christian counselor is who I ended up reaching out to, but years and years later, um, you can't get well by yourself. You have to, um, you know, you have to reach out to a Sunday school teacher or a minister or family or friends and talk to them about what's really going on. And I think what's huge with that, and I'm so glad you said that because I think there's like this shame level, like we're going to make God look bad something like that if we don't have it all together or people's like well when I get it together then I'm going to you know reach exactly. out to people I just I'm going to try to get myself together first before I get the help it's like, but that's not that's not that's how it not, works you know that's not how it works and I came from a Christian family who um, I don't think my parents intended for me to be this way but for whatever reason I just thought that like you said we as Christians were supposed to pr- project this perfect persona and that's mm-hmm. really not true. That's really not true. I don't think that's what God wants. He wants us to lean on each other, and especially he wants us to lean on him, you know. So um, I, I did a lot of that. I did lean on the Lord, and I have journals full of my prayers to God saying, help me. I don't know what's happening. And I think in the end that's why I wrote a book, because I was praying that somebody out there had gone through something similar that we could relate to to each other. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I was hoping that people, I could help connect people to each other that it had had similar experiences. I mean, mine was a lot, mine's deeper than just the CTE thing. As you've seen, looking at my book, I mean, CTE is a huge factor. It killed Grant, and that's what he died of, and I want to talk about that. But I also want women to know that you can have help. If you're in a situation where your marriage has changed from this loving, kind relationship into an abusive situation in any way, um, you don't help yourself by staying in it alone. You have to talk to someone. And I love that. And I, you know, when I was reading it, so I felt like what I loved about it for women is like it's okay to have a voice. Like it's okay yeah. to share the fact that it wasn't all perfect. But at the same time, it's okay to share that there was a time where it felt like that. Like we've all been there. And I think that relatability, and I'm, I'm really glad in the beginning you took that time to share who he, like, who he really was at his core. Um, because that's what you fell in love with, you know, and yeah. then love is patient and is kind. And you went through a lot. Cause I know there was a, a very poignant part when I was, I think it was around chapter 12 and you were talking about he wanted you guys to move to another area that was a little bit more expensive. And, you know, you had to pull the kids out of school. And it's just that tug as a mom is like, I'm trying to create some stability here and yeah. you're uprooting us again. And it's like, it's so hard. I know it's Christian women as wives. And like, you know, yeah. you have to be submissive and you want to make sure you're doing the right thing for your husband or you want to do the right thing for your kids. So if you could speak a little more to just that, that internal yeah. fear that you felt, what was that uh-huh. like? And what would you share with other moms who are just kind of still stuck, you know? Again, yes. And I love the fact that in this interview that I'm getting to expound upon these things because this is, this is important and important for women to understand that, yes, we are supposed to be submissive to our husbands, and, yes, we do love our families, but we we can't get ourselves into a situation where we're becoming a codependent and we're um, yeah. just trying to micromanage our lives. I don't think that's what God wants, and I just constantly say, please, 
double check yourself and make sure that you're not getting yourself into a sick situation, which is what happened to me. Um, I, I mean, Grant was a, he, he was physically ill. We, we know now after death that he had brain damage. We had no prior knowledge of that. But yet alcoholism is not easy to live with. By the time he was 30,